everyone, I'm Kristen Grauman. I'll be talking today about people watching for agent learning. So in Embodied AI, there's great opportunity and a great need for developing agents that not only can perceive the environment, but know how to move and interact in the world in the context of that perception. And it's a very exciting time. You see problems spanning the range from autonomous navigation to instruction following agents, to augmented reality systems that can understand our activity and our context. Now, in particular interest is agents that can learn and act within human environments, such as the focus in this workshop. So an agent that might be able to learn how to address a challenge like, or the request, like, could you heat me a cup of tea and bring it to me? This requires both navigating and interacting with the world. So an agent would need to know how to move around this environment, but also what does a cup even look like? How would you grasp it? And importantly, a bunch of things about functionality in the world that go beyond mapping or recognition kind of perception tasks. So things like, can the cup be heated? Where would I go to heat it? How can I heat it? So we're gonna be looking in this talk today at how to teach these agents who we wish to perform such tasks. And if you look at the current literature, the norm, of course, in order to train an embodied agent is to pursue um, direct experience by the robot or demonstrations in the form of, say, kinesthetic demonstrations, state action pair sequences that show exactly how the task should be done. Now, these will remain very important forms of teaching our agents, um, but what we notice is that Vision's role in this kind of training is largely confined to traditional sensing and measuring, so a way to measure what's around the agent. And the key question for this talk today is to think about this question of what can be learned instead on the perception side by watching people and what they do. So here I want to motivate this through this egocentric video that you're watching. This is a head mounted camera and we can see this video is already telling us a lot about how people move in the environment, where they direct their attention over time, as they do tasks, how they interact with other people, and very importantly, how they interact with objects that are in their perceptual stream. Okay, so we want to think about these questions of how to take video in particular and translate these kind of lessons that people are showing us just through implicitly through such video in order to inform the intelligent agents we build, whether for robotics or augmented reality. So that's the overarching theme of the talk today, people watching for agent learning. We want to move towards intelligent embodied agents that can learn by watching how people interact. And in this talk, I'm going to um, have two main parts in the following. One where we think about this question from the context of environments um, and the spaces in which the agent exists. And the second part where we think of this um, intelligence in terms of objects and so how objects can be used. Um, these go hand in hand, so in both cases we're going to be talking about what actions are possible, what are the affordances that we can understand from the visual stream, whether we look at environments or objects. Okay, so let's start first with the environments. And here we have the core question, how do I map a space? Here I'm showing you a 3D environment from the top-down view. And a traditional approach looking at such an environment would be very naturally to map it, right? To map it either in a geometric or metric way, or to map it in a semantic way, seeing what objects we see in any given place, or what room types we have. Now we want to move beyond this, and in this following work, I'm going to be showing you how we instead think of this environment as a place to map in terms of its functionality. So as these yellow labels are suggesting, we want to understand what's possible to do where in a physical environment. And to get there, we're going to look at video. So here I'm showing you another different clip from an egocentric video. Now this is egocentric, it means the camera's worn on the head of the person who's taking this video. And what we see right away is that the video we get is strongly influenced by how this camera wear interacts with the world around them. We're seeing the eyes through their, that we're seeing the world through their eyes and that means through the lens of their own goals. Okay, and it leads to some interesting questions that we could pull from such video such as understanding what will the person do next, or what are the areas in this environment in which key activities appear, or how could this space be used, whether it's now or later. Okay, so 
in the first technical contribution I want to show in this talk, we're looking um, at how to represent video, especially egocentric video, in terms of human use. And we call the approach egotopo because from egocentric video, rather than consider this video as a stack of frames, as traditional video encodings may, we want to consider it in the context of how people are performing activities. In particular, we build a topological graph of the environment that captures how people use it. And so in this graph, we're reorganizing the video content into the different actions that happen in any given place and those places rough spatial proximity. Okay, so a node in this graph is going to be something we'll call an activity zone that's comprised of the series of visits to that place in which the person was there and did some coherent set of activities. Okay, so ego topo is a structured video representation. It's defined by how a person navigates and uses a space. And we think that it has two key elements that allow us to better reason about what people do. The first, it will allow us to reason about first person behavior in terms of common traversals. Say, from the video we may detect that a person moves frequently from pulling a vegetable out of the fridge to the sink to wash it. So that's one key element. The other key element is environment affordances, where we want to be able to capture how this agent moves in the space in order to do things in certain zones. That will allow us to then have agents that can plan out where to do which interactions within a related space. OK, so now let me talk about exactly how we build these topological graphs. So first, we need um, what we call a localization network that's going to say whether frames belong in the same node or not. And this is a Siamese network that's trained with, on the left, some traditional measures of visual similarity or geometric consistency in order to say these frames go together or not, but also in terms of some human-centric cues, namely um, proximity and time suggesting nearness in the same activity, as well as the similarity in function or the similar distribution of actions or objects in these frames we're considering. On the flip side, frames won't go together if they're visually dissimilar or far, far um, further separated in time. Now, with this localization network, then, we can move through the video in sequence and assign frames to nodes what, uh, based on whether they belong closely to that existing node or not. And if they don't belong close to any existing node, we'll form a new node dynamically in this topological graph. Okay, so here as we're looking through, if we find this frame that's dissimilar from all the other nodes, we would create a new node. And as we find a frame that matches well according to the localization network, it will get joined into that node. Okay, so remember each node then is a catalog of all the activities that a person did throughout this long video at that given um, place. Okay, so over time, the graph is constructed frame by frame for each egocentric video to capture the zones of the human action, and the visits to each of these zones are then cataloged at each, at each node. Okay, and here you see one just being composed on the left from the video that was running on the right. So with such a graph, now we have two important tasks for which we can use it, anticipation of future activity and scene affordances. I'm going to show both those tasks and some results for them in the following. Okay, so the first one, anticipating future actions. Here, the task is to watch some portion of the video and predict the set of actions that will be seen in the remainder of that video. And we'll sweep this portion, K, um, from left to right such that we see more or anticipate more of the video. So this is a great task, this long-term anticipation task, because it requires an understanding of how much of the activity has already elapsed and what would be required to complete it. Furthermore, we are doing this with long-form video. So the future that we're trying to anticipate is going to consist of anywhere from 5 to 45 minutes into the future. And this is in contrast to what's been treated most recently in the literature for egocentric video, where the anticipation was just, say, one second ahead in time. Okay, so to do this task and to do it at a long time frame, we do need a reliable encoding of the past video, and that's where the ego topo graph comes in. So we'll first encode the video as a topological graph, as I just showed, and then aggregate all the visits to the nodes as a feature vector. Then we encode the entire set of nodes through a graph convolutional neural network, and this is what will generate a feature 
for video level classification, or in this case, for anticipation. So we'll train this network in order to predict the probability of each action occurring in the future video. Okay, so how does this do? So here we're looking at two different data sets, Epic Kitchens on the left and the Georgia Tech egocentric data set on the right. And what we're looking at here are the accuracy levels for this anticipation task in terms of mean average precision for um, some our method and some different baselines. Now those baselines are in the top, what we would call pure video methods that think of these frames in terms of 3D convolutions and recurrent networks in order to encode what has happened. Uh, and then just below that, some more complex temporal aggregation schemes from literature. And what you can see is that overall, um, this proposed ecotopo graph is allowing us to get stronger anticipation for both of these data sets. Now that was the first task to show. The second task that we want to use ecotopo for is predicting the environment affordances. So an affordance means a potential for action. And we want agents that could look at a video or frame like this and predict not only what's happening now, but also what could be happening here. So in this clip, you know, I'm turning on the stove, say, but there are many things unobserved for this very environment that are also possible. Pouring salt, mixing stock, etc. So there's many other likely interactions. Many of them have not been seen exactly in this location. So how do we train agents that can come into unmapped environments and anticipate the possibility of any such action? Okay, so here again, we're gonna draw an ego topo to address this task. And what we want to do is to be able to expand the set of labels associated with a given node in this graph to include those that are possible, although not observed. And our key insight here is to pay attention not just to what happened in this particular environment, say this kitchen, kitchen number one, but to also link nodes across environments based on shared functionality. Okay, so from one video to another video, from one kitchen to another kitchen, will form what we call consolidated topological graph in which nodes get linked when they have similar action and object distributions, which implies they have similar functionality. Okay, and by doing this now, we can inherit the labels of those nodes and other graphs that had um, a different set of actions observed. So we'll expand the label set then for the initial video clip to those that happened in the other related graph nodes. Having done this, now we can propagate those labels and train the affordance model to map from visual frames to potential labels. Again, evaluating this on the two data sets I mentioned before, Epic Kitchens and the Georgia Tech data, we can see that compared to in the top methods that purely pay attention to the physical space in a, a metric or mapped way, or a pure, what we call a pure 3D approach, um, are falling short of our method, as are methods that try to propagate the labels, not just based on geometry, but based on visual similarity. We get the best generalization for these affordance predictions using these consolidated topological graphs. So what does it mean? Well, now you can look at a clip of the video or a frame of the video and see it not just for what's happening, but for what might be possible there. And this suggests right away kind of applications in robotics and augmented reality where space needs to be understood in terms of human use and in terms of human use that has yet to occur. Such that, for example, an agent could solve how to perform new interactions in a new environment or an AR system could help me to know where to do different parts of my new tasks that I'm learning. And these image examples show just a couple examples from our system um, where these are bubbles looking at different frames associated with a given node, one on the left, another on the right. And those probabilities at the top are color coded according to some afforded actions that are most prominent for those two instances. For example, on the right hand side, it's most likely that pouring water would happen in this place. It's also likely that squeezing sponge could happen as you see in the orange and the purple circles. Okay, so it's leading us to um, agents that can look at a space as we do in terms of walking into a new friend's kitchen and knowing pretty much how to use it, even though we haven't literally seen that space before. Okay, so this part of the talk was about ego topo. This is um, work for being able to encode video, not just as a stack of frames, but through the 
eyes of how the environment affects an agent's actions. And we think that egocentric video is very important to bring to the forefront, forefront this relationship between the agent and the physical space. Okay, so in the next part of this talk, I'm gonna continue with the environment thread. And what I've just shown you is how we could take egocentric video and now understand a physical space as a topological graph organized by human action. Now I want to go further to consider how to take these kind of visual affordance models and allow them to inform an embodied agent that we train. So for this, we're talking about tasks such as this one, where we want to learn a policy, not just to navigate around the space, but to perform an interactive task. So for example, could you heat a cup of tea and bring it to me? Now there's a lot of exciting work happening and being shared at this uh, workshop as well to do so by learning policies. So whether by imitation learning or some reinforcement learning, learning which objects, and interactions are relevant in order to solve a particular goal. Okay. So this will be a specialized policy, a policy that knows how to solve that kind of question. But then if we do have you know, the next question in the new environment, or then um, we need to redo this learning. So we need a policy that can accommodate this kind of new environment and new goal. And so the, what I'm about to show you is to try and step into some meta um, exploration mode in which our agents are prepared to interact even in environments they haven't seen before, such that this kind of learning of specialized policies can be much more efficient. And we call this idea interaction exploration. So the goal in particular is to learn the visual affordance landscape that in such a way that it can guide an agent for where to attempt unfamiliar actions in unfamiliar environments. Okay, so what we want the agent to be able to do is to figure out this affordance landscape. So what are the interactable objects anyway? What actions would be relevant to use them and under which conditions are these actions going to succeed? And I'll show you in a minute how we do this. I'm still kind of displaying what this, such an agent would give us if we're successful in this goal of interaction exploration. It would be able to look at a new environment like this and have an expectation about where different actions might be possible before it has actually tried these interactions so that for that new environment, it can answer these questions about what can I do where. Okay, and the key idea we have to achieve this is to train an interaction exploration policy that rewards getting as many successful interactions as possible with as many objects as possible under a budget of time. Okay, so we're gonna train agents that know how to start out using a new environment as quickly as possible. Now, what that means is that an agent could be primed to do tasks like wash my coffee cup in the sink, even though they haven't yet been trained specifically for that task. So we're gonna consider this a way to kickstart policy learning for a specific downstream task. And furthermore, it will give us a prior for which actions can be done where in an unfamiliar environment such as this image shows, looking at the new space now, we've seen through um, these visual affordances of where I think I could open or toggle or pick something up. So finally, the key insight then, just kind of bringing this together for this interaction exploration approach is that exploration itself will help us train a policy to build a visual affordance model. So for example, if the agent has successfully opened a fridge at some point, it can learn that objects with handles are likely to be openable. And similarly, if it toggles over here with a button, other buttons might look similarly toggleable in the future. But on the reverse side, the visual affordance model itself, as built up in the color-coded image on the right, is going to be the thing that gives the agent a useful prior to start to be intelligent about where it even attempts to do these interactions in the first place. Okay, so these two things go hand in hand and we're gonna be trying to train them jointly, both the ability to quickly move around the environment and try new things that work, as well as build this visual affordance model that indicates where are the good things to try. All right, so after all that introduction, then let me say a little bit more about how it works. So I said we wanna train a policy that's able to quickly interact with as many things as possible. 
So we're going to study this in the AI to Thor environments, and we reward an agent for finding um, and executing an interaction that succeeds. So it's for any case where I've selected an action that's an interaction ob uh, action, like take, open, toggle, etc., and it's the first time I've done so with an object of that particular type, then we get a reward. Okay, so we're just training an exploration policy that is eager to find new objects and new actions that can be done to them. Okay, so we have to keep in mind, of course, the agent doesn't know at the onset what objects are, what they're named, which ones can be interacted with, which versus which are just patches of um, texture in the environment that don't do anything. And it doesn't know yet which interactions will work with, with, with which objects. Okay, so this will be a discovery process for the agent. Now, if we've trained such a policy to do well at this kind of speedy exploration of new interactions, then as we're executing the policy itself, we're going to be able to learn these visual affordances. So maybe this agent is selecting actions, you know, some of them are navigational, like it's turning right, it's moving forward. Here it executed a toggle action and say it succeeded in this particular um, time step. Then what, ha what happens to train our visual affordance model is through this direct experience, the agent sees this was successful. And now think of kind of marking that visual occurrence. However, we don't just want to mark it as we saw it there. For generalization, we want to mark it everywhere that we had seen it up into leading into that point, such that, you know, for that toggle on that coffee maker, whether we see it from afar or from another viewpoint, we'll start to learn that this looks like something toggleable. So think of it like a paintball gun. The agent is imagining on the space where um, it had just done a successful interaction, and now we'll take bootstrap that back through all the video frames connected to that one in terms of the same object. And then this gives us an affordance data set to train a model. And so here's what that process looks like. The agent's going through, it's trying different things, as you see in the top left, what it's trying. And when it succeeds, we mark it green. If it fails, we mark it yellow. So here we have a, a supervised data set built on the fly by the agent itself by trying things and seeing which ones worked. And it's going to then build up a visual affordance model by doing so. Okay, so we train this model then, not just for one interaction, but for all the possible object and <coughs> action combinations. So then we have one channel per afforded action as we look at the world through the lens of where does it look like I could do any of these verbs. Okay, so putting this then together, we have as input um, into this policy learning approach, we have the RGB as well as these affordance maps that are predicted from the RGB image. Okay, so where can I put, toggle, take, etc. for every possible action in the agent's action space. Then we'll train a policy network that produces this interaction exploration uh, uh, policy. And remember, I said that the reward for this one is whether um, or not that action was successful and is it new. So we're encouraged to find the new and successful ones. And all the meantime, we're training this, um, leveraging and training this visual affordance model. So as we saw before, as we roll out a trajectory here, we're able to build up that model of what's possible where, given the visual stream. And the two work together because as the agent's better equipped to look at the space and expect what's possible, it's going to gravitate to those places and more quickly, in fewer samples and fewer time steps, find the places where these will lead to a reward. Okay, so we've explored this approach with AI to, um, to Thor. And we've been concentrated here on all the kitchen environments. So 30 different kitchen environments split up into training, validation, and testing. And every time we start an agent, um, we're going to start it at a random position in one of these environments. OK, so let me first show you qualitatively what happens when we run this whole thing. And then I'll show you some quantitative results. So the video I'm going to show next has this format. On the left, we see the egocentric view of the agent. On the right, we see the top-down view of the entire environment where the agent is the white robot moving around and that trajectory will show its path. Now on the right hand side, those green dots will be again places where successful interactions happened. Yellow dots will be failured, failed uh, interactions. On the left, bottom right box R will show the reward as it accumulates. 
and on the top left it will show you what action was attempted when. Okay, so here we go through the video and this on the egocentric side, we see what the agent sees, plus we see the agent's affordance map color-coded in there, where different colors correspond to different actions or interactions. And you can see that it's looking to move around quickly and try things that are likely to work. And so on the right, as you look, you're hoping to see more green dots than yellow dots. And on the left, you're looking to see that that reward goes up high because it's finding things that it can successfully do. And we have to remember, the agent is looking at this with fresh eyes, just in the sense of, you know, it doesn't yet know a script for how to work with these objects, it has to discover which things look openable, which things look toggleable. And here it's doing so, such that, you know, these countertops look like places it could place things or take things, the doors look like things that could be opened, the drawers do too, and it's trying many of these quite quickly. Now in contrast, here if I show you a baseline approach, which is a state-of-the-art and standard approach to do navigational exploration, which is to reward for novelty, but now just novelty in the um, navigation space. So here you see that agent moving around, and by the time the episode's over, it's in, accumulated a lot of failed interactions. So to build this baseline, we let it reward novelty in the spatial coordinates, but at every new spatial coordinate, it's going to cycle through the possible interactions and see which ones stick. Okay, so a model not informed by this visual affordance learning has a much harder time finding where things are even possible to do. Here's one more video example of our approach in a different environment where, again, it's looking, it's very quickly just um, and intelligently trying to find the things that it could try to do, like picking up different objects, placing them down, opening doors, opening drawers, thinking about where it might be possible to place, use, um, or otherwise change the environment with these objects. So when we quantify the results of doing this kind of interaction exploration, what we care about is the coverage of interaction. So the fully equipped agents in these new environments would have perfect coverage, meaning of all the interactions and with objects that are possible, it has tried them. And so that's what we want to see, that rate, and we want to see it over time going up sharply. And so that's what this plot is showing us, and the baselines are a random agent that moves around randomly and then cycles over the possible interactions, as well as a curiosity exploration approach. This is a, a commonly used exploration approach for agents where it favors selecting actions that lead to states that can't be predicted well, as well as some other baselines we built using um, classic exploration measures like novelty and object coverage. So here um, in red, novelty, picking new locations and then cycling over interactions, the video I showed you a couple months ago with this, as well as an object coverage one that turns out to be the best baseline that visits new objects uh, and is then cycles over interactions. Okay, so these are traditional exploration methods, and what we find is this interaction exploration agent that we've trained discovers 33% more interactions than these baselines. Okay, so we now have a way to get to know new spaces and how to use them rapidly. So the final result I want to show for this part of the work is that other um, use of interaction exploration, which is to prepare ourselves for downstream task-specific um, policy learning. Okay. So now we do want to solve, say, a particular task with this agent, but what happens if we come in with this prior exploration policy that we've learned in order to then fine-tune towards the task of interest? Can we speed up learning? Can these policies be any more accurate? Okay, so the task, the specific tasks that we looked at are the four you see here. We're again doing this in the AI Thor environment. The tasks are retrieved, take an object out of a drawer and set it somewhere outside, store, wash, heat. Okay, so we look at all these four and then we want to know how do we do if we pre-train with the policy I've just shown you and then fine-tune for a task-specific reward for each of these in turn versus if we were to train them from scratch in the usual, usual way. And these results show what we get. So for the four different tasks on columns on the left or as the curves on the right, what I'm showing you is the, the set of baselines from before as well as our approach in the bottom on the left-hand side. These are success rates um, as far as achieving those four different tasks. And on the right, we're looking at the average reward over um, time during training. 
compared to the next best baseline. And so what we see is we are getting more successful policies and furthermore, we're speeding up the learning to get them. Okay, so this is the, uh, an early step, but an exciting one for us to think how the kind of visual affordances we could learn from video and agent experience can then allow for agents that are better equipped to enter unfamiliar environments and tackle new tasks very quickly. So this part of the talk so far has been about um, watching how, how people interact in environments in order to train our agents. And the remainder, I'm going to talk about the same question, but now specifically in the context of objects. So when we think about object affordances, we mean we need to go beyond traditional recognition, beyond naming objects when we see them, to actually using them. And of course, this is central to an embodied agent, to robotics, problems where we need to touch and interact with these objects. So we want to be able to look at this lamp and say, well, here it could be toggled. This is where I could adjust it. This is where I could grasp. And this will sound very much like what I was talking about earlier in the talk, um, but now we're concentrating specifically at the object level, whereas earlier I was thinking in the broad um, environment space. So how you could do this today with um, existing vision methods? Well, what's been pursued is really traditional kind of supervised learning, <coughs> where you would learn from labeled examples how to recognize places on objects where these different actions are possible. So you can imagine getting labeled images from uh, crowd workers to say, where's all the places you could hold this book, getting those labeled and then training a semantic segmentation engine in order to produce such labels on new objects. Now, the problem is not only is this somewhat expensive, right? It's direct manual supervision, but also, and probably more importantly, it only captures at a distance what people expect is important in order to do a given interaction. Right, because we're asking them to label with a mouse, such work would label with a mouse, you know, where we think hold is possible. In contrast, here's what we propose. We want to be able to learn, again, from people watching. And in this case, we would like to learn affordance models about objects directly from video of people interacting with those objects. I think doing so is going to allow us to cut this middle man of, you know, labeled images and get a richer, more nuanced view of what these different actions mean for different objects. And we'll do this both with third person and first person video. So to say a bit about the model, we start with weekly labeled video. So we have video for which we know that an open action is happening, for example. And we'll train a video model to do recognition. So here an LSTM that could look at a sequence of frames and recognize when open is happening or something else. But then the key thing we need to add is to anticipate the possible actions, even the ones we're not currently seeing. So here what we do is during training, we want to be able to take a photo of an inactive object, the object at rest with no one interacting with it, and predict what this object would look like if we were to achieve one of the given actions like open. Okay, so from that video model then at the bottom row, we'll take this aggregated state for the action of interest from a confident frame in the label training video. And then we'll train this anticipation network in the top in yellow in order to map the inactive object to that aggregated state. Okay, so this is the key part to treat it not just as a recognition problem, but as a video model that can anticipate what it takes to map the object at rest to the object in action. So from there, then, we want to be able to not just anticipate the actions that are possible, but localize the regions that most suggest it's possible. And these are what we're going to treat as so-called interaction hotspots. So we take the model I've described so far, and then through a class activation mapping technique, like GradCam, we visualize the spatial regions on the original image that are maximally activated for a specific class. So for example, in this photo, there's a refrigerator at rest. And for the action pullable, we can look at what are the spatial regions in that original photo that are most suggestive of anticipating that pull action. And those will be, this is a heat map then that says where the interaction hotspots are for pull. And imagine now doing the same thing for every possible verb in this vocabulary of actions. So 
look at the same photo, but now get a different heat map for everywhere that it looks pressable, and so on. So we'll take these interaction hotspots, and we've trained them and evaluated them on two data sets, Epic Kitchens that I've been showing in some earlier results, that's the one on the right, and Oprah, which is a YouTube video collection from Stanford showing people demonstrating different products. And the key thing is that we'll train on these video data sets, and then we're going to generate these hotspot maps on novel images. And those new images, not only are they unseen for the instance, but they also will be tested in terms of unseen categories. Okay, and this is important because we want agents, again, that can come into a new space, figure out how to move around, figure out where actions are even possible, and figure out which objects are most suggestive of the actions they want to achieve. So let us first again look at qualitative examples and then I'll show you a little bit of numbers. Here are interaction hotspots from our approach, color coded for the action. So green means mixable. And as we watch this video, we see that the stuff in the bowl looks mixable even before the person starts mixing it. Same with the pot behind it. And in each of these examples, I'm showing just a subset of the verbs that exist in this data and that are being predicted. Um, the five at the bottom, cuttable, mixable, adjustable, openable, washable, these are the most frequent ones occurring in the video. Um, but there's some um, dozens of others that are included. So here's another sample where pink looks, are, are the regions that look washable to our method. And that includes the thing they're washing actually, but also that knife that's dirty sitting there on the left hand side. Another clip, the pat, pan is mixable, those jars looked openable. Here's a door that also looks openable even before the person reaches to open it. Final example I'll show for these hotspots on the left, this is traditional saliency, and on the right is our hotspots. And this is a key comparison to show that we're seeing the world not as the things that look interesting alone, but the things that look like something this agent could do some interaction with. So we're seeing the world through this first person view of what actions are possible where. And just as earlier in the talk, this is exciting, we think, for being able to map what's learned in the visual stream from what even what people are doing to agents and embodied AI that are capable of prioritizing their actions in new environments and with new objects. So what kind of you know, uh, accuracy do these hotspot maps have? So if we evaluate the heat maps that are being produced against ground truth ones, here's what we get for those two data sets I mentioned, OPRA and EPIC. This is a slew of metrics, all of them trying to say how good or how aligned are those hotspot maps. The ones at the top of the chart are all weekly supervised in different manners. Uh, and this includes some methods for egocentric gaze estimation from video, um, and saliency, and others, as well as our method shown in that row with the bold. And then there's also some, as a calibration, some strongly supervised methods, methods that actually use manually labeled examples in a traditional way to learn the semantic segmentation of these heat maps. And when we see that despite this much lighter and direct supervision of our approach through video, we can have um, quite competitive hotspots produced and furthermore much better than any existing weekly supervised method was able to give. Right, so with these hotspots then, this focus has been, you know, how good are they in terms of saying where, which actions are possible where, but we're also interested in seeing how they can augment our agent's ability to recognize objects. So we know that people use object function um, not only to decide what to do where in a scene, but also to recognize new things. So if I know how something works, I'm more quick to understand what it might be. So we took this in some initial tests on the computational side to see if this will carry over for our systems using hotspots. So what I'm showing you here is an array of refrigerator images from Coco, and below are the ResNet 50 predictions. Some of them are easier, like the ones on the left, because they're more canonical refrigerators. Some of them are more challenging and fail, like the ones towards the right, which are a typical context and views. Okay, so that's just with a vanilla ResNet trying to do traditional image classification. However, what we found is if we encode these images, not just by their appearance, like this um, pre-trained ResNet, but also in terms of their hotspot feature encodings, which say which, where interactions are possible, this gives a functional encoding of the object that for the low shot 
training regime actually bumps up recognition and accuracy. And that's what these numbers are showing you. If we had only five labeled image examples for each class, these recognition rates go up modestly, but encouragingly so, once we incorporate our hotspot features. So in short, this means we're seeing better low shot object recognition by anticipating object function. All right, so in the very final piece of this talk, I want to move um, to bring this kind of visual affordance at the object level, again, into our embodied agents. So we want the visual affordances not just as the endpoint, but as a, a representation that benefits the agent learning to do some active task. And in this case, I'm going to turn to a dexterous robot hand with 30 degrees of freedom that we want to learn to do functional grasping. Industrious uh, manipulation is very challenging. Traditionally, you would augment a reinforcement learner with demonstrations of state action pairs in order to learn from um, exact demonstration how to do something. But our idea is a bit different. We want to use visual affordances in order to prime this agent to learn how to grasp new objects. And what's great about the dexterous hand as a morphology, it's very much aligned with the human hand. And so this is all the more reason that what we could learn from images, what we could learn from doing people watching, could benefit our agent. So what we pose is to have the agent look at these objects, anticipate their affordance regions in ways similar to what I was just showing you or, or even in supervised manner from an image-based model, predict where a person would use or hold the object, and then encourage the policy to prefer such regions. In other words, encourage that the dexterous hand meet and it be attracted to the places that, according to the visual affordance model, would get used by a person. And in what I'll just show you in a few more slides before we close, is how that doing so will give us not only faster learning, but also better grasping, and perhaps most importantly, the ability to generalize to new objects. Not just new in, um, instances, but new object categories. Okay, and this is really essential to the reason why we build this in an object-centric way. So rather than a traditional demonstration caring about exactly the state of the hand for the person, we're looking at this through um, the object-centric um, position where we find things on the object that are likely to help this. And all this is to say, <coughs> we may have learned about handles on frying pans, but then you show us a handle on a hammer, and it still looks like something that's useful to do this grasp. And that's an object-centric affordance that will allow us to generalize to new objects unseen during training. Okay, so the model we've introduced to do this, we call GRASP for GRASP Affordance Model. And on the top row here from the green, this is the visual affordance that looks at the objects and anticipates where a human would do a functional GRASP for them. And now we're just connecting this to a deep reinforcement learning policy that will take not only our GBD, but also these affordance regions and learn to do successful grasping with that. And so the reward is based on whether or not the agent's getting the thing off of the table, and in our case, for the graph model, whether or not it's bringing the hand close to these afforded regions. Okay, so that's the method in a very short form. So now let's look at what happens as we train this graph model for here are six of the 40 or so objects that we've tested. So here's the training progression first. So early on, you know, it's fiddling around, just trying to figure out how do I get this thing off the table. For all these different six objects, here we're at 800 iterations, starting to do a bit better, gravitating towards those regions like the scissors or the frying pan handle, where a human would also grasp them for a functional grasp. And indeed, we can train these policies. Graph here is the blue curve for a successful grasp, um, more successful grasp, as well as faster than what we could get if we were in red using no prior, just doing the deep RL in a, in a um, traditional vanilla way, or even if we had a prior that said to gravitate towards the center of mass, here denoted CON. Okay, so this is exciting, and we're getting a 3x speed up, in fact, in the speed of this learning for the same level of accuracy and achieving um, significantly more successful policies. So I'll show you what some of those graphs looks like. look like here. Um, there's going to be four videos that play in just a moment. The top left one is a pure RL baseline with no prior about where to grasp. 
So it'll have the same reward as us in terms of getting the thing off the table, it's good, but it doesn't have any preference to grasp on the afforded regions. Of regions. On the top right, we'll look at the center of mass prior. So it does have some prior about where to put the hand. Bottom left, we'll look at a state-of-the-art approach for bringing in imitation learning with RL. So this is state action pairs to do the demonstrations and then trying to learn to grasp all these objects from it. And on the bottom right then is our approach graph. So I'll play the video and then we'll see it trying to do different graphs as well as some red arrows that show us kind of applying forces to the object to see if the learned graphs are stable after they're picked up. So here we go. What you can see is that the no prior in the top left is kind of more fumbling around, less successful at even figuring out how to get this thing in that complex 30 degree of freedom hand. Center of mass can sometimes help in order to find a more stable place to grab. The state action pairs are better than both of the above, however, less able to do generalization to new objects. Because remember, those demonstrations have to be suitable enough for the objects that are going to be actually seen. Whereas in the bottom right, the graph approach we're proposing is more often able to find not just a way to pick up the object, but a way to do so that will allow a functional grasp. And here you're seeing that with a variety of objects. In the paper, we test this with 40 different objects, including familiar ones that have been seen um, before during training, as well as unfamiliar ones that have never been experienced. Right, so I'm going to close the talk here. This um, entire talk has been about people watching for agent learning. I looked at this from the environment side and the object side. On the environment side, I talked about learning affordances from egocentric video with the egotopo model. And then we talked about translating what's a visual affordance about the environment to an agent that actually performs specific tasks or is able to do generic exploration of interactions in new environments. On the object side, I talked about learning hotspots for where to manipulate and use an object in different ways directly from weekly labeled video. And then I trans we talked about translating um, visual affordance models again, but now for learning dexterous hand grasping policies. Now, all the work I was sharing today is thanks to the people you see here, Tushar Nagarajan, Yang Hao Lee, Kristoff, and Priyanka. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for watching, and I'd be glad to answer questions during the live session at the workshop.